you know it is. Be a little early. Um, first, on the assignment, we, um, along with myself, is itself such a complex entity to work with. We can't hope to be done with it today, but I'll rigorously restrict us to only oh, about first third or so of our time next week, and then I want us to go on to Stephen's. So I ask you to bring both books with you. Uh, there are three different paperback volumes of Stephen's, one of them called Collected Poems, but uh, this is the only good one. This is the only one which is carefully edited, edited by the late poet's daughter, Holly Stevens. It's a volume of selected poems called The Poem at the End of the Mind, that being the first line of the death poem called Of Near Being. It's a vintage paperback. I ask you to read just these poems for next time. Um, the crucial one is the long poem, Notes for the Supreme Fiction, which you've never read it before. Uh, it's a poem in 31 uh, sections. It's going to be something of a surprise, but read it in sequence. Uh, what starts with some of the early harmonium poems, first Nomad, Exquisite. It's a poem very much of Stevens's delight in what he calls Florida. Um, then a triad of crisis poems, written very close together in time. The Man Whose Ferris Was Bad, The Snowman, which is a very famous poem, and he of the Palaz of Hoon, which began to have a kind of dialectical relation. Then comes a long hiatus in his poetry. He starts to come out of it with that rather extraordinary little poem called The Sun This March, um, written in the early 30s, which is meant here as an introduction to one of the two major texts, in it, one of the three the next time, The Idea of Order at Key West, a very famous poem written in 1934. There's a poem written a few years later, most extraordinary, I think, of his lyrics, and the poem I would like us to discuss is a kind of paradigm of his poetry, the poems of our climate. And then the big poem, which we will also go on with the time after, but in connection with a longish crisis poem by him called The Auroras of Autumn, and a few other late poems. Uh, if you find that you want commentary on Stevens, I quite unblushingly remark that the only commentary uh, worth bothering with you will find as a large paperback book with a rather blue cover, if I remember properly, called Wallace Stevens' The Poems of Our Climate by myself. It's a Cornell paperback it's in libraries. Or, what? Yes, it uh, has to do with the, the joke that I enact in the epigraph, for which I was much blamed. It's a rather splendid passage, in which, so far as I know, referring not to Joyce's bloom, but to the realist painter Hyman Bloom, who I see is still alive. Um, speaks of Bloom, who with his vast accumulation stands in regards and repeats the primitive life. The prophecy of myself, but I think he is referring to the painter and in Bloom. In any case, uh, bring the poem at the end of the mind with you. Uh, I'll talk about essays then, because we have two more seminars, of which next week uh, is the first, and there is a procedure, I gather, for late essays, and of course most of the essays will be late. Um, but I gather they are very rational and imaginative about that sort of thing here. And I just have to read up on what the procedure is. So even though it is still a little bit early, I would like to get started uh, because of the complications of Song of Myself. And what I'd like to do with the poem, looking at the final version, even though I prefer the original version, the one at the back of this book, but knowing that some of you have other volumes with you anyway, I'm on page 63, uh, the received text, which is the final text, modified throughout Whitman's life of the poem that he eventually called Song of Myself. Originally, it had no title. It was simply the first of the poems or text in the volumes called Le volume called Leaves of Grass, and more about the title later, um, in the year 1855, um, the first edition of the poem. And the next edition, he actually gave it a title. It was then called Poem of Walt Whitman, an American, Worth remarking because one of the three, call them psychic agencies or instances in a Freudian sense by which he represents aspects of what could be called broadly his self, uh, the persona, the myself of song of myself is that Walt Whitman, an American, actually spoken of in one line of the poem as Walt Whitman, one of the roughs, an American, originally with no punctuation in that rather uh, splendid line, but I, I want to begin by talking about those three aspects of, um, call it three psychic agencies, certainly not an ego, an id, and a superego, nothing of the sort, 
but they are respectively myself, Walt Whitman, one of the Robson American, an external self or persona or mask, as classical poets would have called it, the extraordinary being who will appear first in section five and then recur in crucial places, the real me or me myself, called by both names, the kind of inner self, quite different from Walt Whitman, one of the roughs, an American, and then the entity called, pretty clearly following Emerson, my soul, uh, about which Whitman has surprisingly little to say, and the crucial thing seems to be what its different relations are, on the one hand to myself and the much more vexed relationship, in fact the impossibility of relationship between the real me or me myself, but I just want to explain in a kind of quick not outline, but suggestive scrawl, as it were, what I would like us uh, to do. Taking the final version of the poem, I want to look at three moments in what become the first three sections of it. Well, four moments, actually. Four out of the first six sections. One, four, five, and six. And I want us to look at the two extraordinary crisis moments. If they are moments, they are rather prolonged in the poem. Uh, one begins in section 24 and reaches a real intensity about halfway through the poem in sections 26 and 7. The other occurs uh, towards the end of section 37 and throughout 38. They are very different crises, and uh, even if we get no further today than juxtaposing the two of them in the light of the presentation of those three psychic agencies or instances in the first six sections of the poem, I would feel that we had done enough. Whitman is, of course, a strikingly original poem, far more original indeed in substance and in poetic personae and in rhetorical stance than he is in the apparent openness of his form, uh, a thoroughly Emersonian uh, poet who nevertheless has uh, a considerable departure from Emerson from the beginning, for an overwhelming instance of what Emerson celebrated as self-reliance. Uh, a profoundly evasive poet, a poet whose strange facticity for us now, I think, is that he keeps saying, I will reveal everything, I will strip everything away, and of course he does nothing of the sort. He is profoundly evasive, he is not at all the poet he is supposed to be, he is as hermetic, difficult, subtle, and nuanced as he pretends to be open, populistic, and self-revelatory. Um, he is indeed perhaps the most hermetic uh, poet in the English language in the last 150 years. A far more difficult poet, I am now convinced, than Blake, only scarcely less difficult than Dickinson, but for reasons very difficult than um, Dickinson's more elliptical kind of difficulty. Difficulties that have to do with the sense in which, as a master of evasion, which is another name for a trope, uh, he is the direct father of what Stevens um, does so remarkably in our time, though perhaps in the end with a less singular power and less originality than Whitman did himself, precisely because of the facticity that Whitman constituted for him. But that, that we can begin to look at next week. Uh, look at the opening of the poem on page 63, if you have this edition or wherever you have it. This is the received or the final version, and I will simply leave out of the first section everything that he added to it. The and seeing myself in the first line is, of course, an addition, and is meant perhaps a little too deliberately, of course, to contrast himself to the writers of classical epic, who can cry out, I sing of the wrath of Achilles, or I sing of the wanderings and homecoming of Odysseus, or I sing of the two together, arms and the man, in Virgil, and so forth simply originally quite palpable and startling, I celebrate myself, and by the way, if somebody gets the door, and if somebody still wishes to come in, they will be able to do so, but we can cut out some of the noise, and, and this will be, after all, difficult um, enough. Uh, notice that the poem, when he does give it its final title, Song of Myself, is not called Song of My Soul, and it's certainly not called the song of the real me or the song of the me myself. It is the song of myself, Walt Whitman, one of the roughs, an American, an outward and deliberately adopted persona, a poetic ego, as it were, if you wish to call it that, which is uh, in itself uh, a very long way from Whitman, whether as human being or Whitman's actual poetical stance in the poem. 
But in any case, it opened in the following way. And I want to get back to the original opening for a moment just to note a couple of points about it or ask you a couple of questions about it. I celebrate myself. Now, there is therefore a suggestion that the I, the ego, the capital letter I, is in some sense different from myself. Either it is more comprehensive, and this is one of at least three instances or agencies that it could choose as the thematic of celebration in its song, or that I have something more to do, and I'm not sure what the answer would be, with either of those other entities which are so rapidly going to be introduced into the poem. Indeed, the soul is introduced in the fourth line, and again in terms of the I doing the speaking, so that seems therefore to limit ourselves either to a comprehensive entity, which would include these various agencies or instances, or perhaps to the notion that there at the beginning, which I think is much less likely, because as soon as we are first shown the real me or me myself, and then we hear, and I think we would need a slash mark here, him slash mark, her speaking, I have noticed through the years in teaching this poem that my female students tend to regard the extraordinary representation of the real me or me myself, which comes in this edition on page 66 in section 4, lines 74 and so on and, and following, they tend to see this as a young boy. I myself always tend to see this as a certain kind of young, rather boyish or tomboyish girl. These come to me days and nights and go from me again, but they are not the me myself. And here is this real me or what I am. Apart from the pulling and falling stands what I am. Stands amused complacent, that by the way is the older meaning. In general, in reading Whitman, use the glossary in back of this volume, which has been carefully done by the editor, uh, Francis Murphy, in the light of dictionary meanings in Whitman's own day. Complacent, of course, does not mean um, the rather negative meaning that it has with us. If one of us says, I am complacent, he or she means something that we don't praise one another for these days. But Whitman uses it in the older meaning, meaning I am happy. I am perfectly content. Still being used really by his F.E.B. Stevens, the famous opening of Sunday morning, complacencies of the peignoir does not mean smugness or self-satisfaction. It means genuine happiness in that particular kind of a situation. But it's now an archaic use of the word complacent. We do not praise one another by saying he or she is complacent. We imply that there is something wrong with us, but not in Whitman. Stands amused, complacent, compassionating, idle, in Whitman, even more than in ourselves, a positive term, as loaf is a positive term, and more of that in a moment of connection with the opening lines, unitary, then quite remarkable lines, look down, is erect, or bends an arm on an impalpable, certain breast, and is very charming, at least to me, looking with side curved head, curious what will come next, both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it, which is a line by John Ashbery, written long before his time, but I think it's part of Ashbury's achievement that he has captured that particular mode in Whitman, so that each time I come to that extraordinarily beautiful line, something in me is startling the feels for a moment that Ashbury has written it, but it is the purest um, Whitman. But in any case, whatever is being represented there, and we will talk about that with some uh, minuteness in a moment, it is not, it seems to me, likely that that can be the capital letter I of the opening of the poem. And so I think that is some kind of a composite poem about which nevertheless the poem will have very little to say. And one passes on very quickly to, and what I assume you shall assume, the reader, and already one sees what one will go on seeing in Whitman, that no one before or since Whitman so literally pulls the reader by the scruff of the neck into the poem. Not so much in terms of telling the reader what to do, but in trying to insist on a full partnership on the part of the reader, which is rather different from that Emersonian stance that I talked about last time, where Emerson is saying, if it reaches you, if it touches you, if it moves you, if you can perceive it as luster, it is because it is a rejected or repressed element in yourself. Therefore, it belongs to you in the first place, and now it returns to you with a certain alienated majesty. Whitman does not wish to admit the possibility of an alienation of that mode of majesty. He therefore tries to drag you, in contradistinction, but it's a direct reaction to Emerson, right into the poem. And then a line which is always taken too lightly, because I will come back to this also. 
in contradistinction, and I think it is a deliberate, as I would say, swerve or pin amen, and I use the term advisedly, not because it's my jargon, but <coughs> to show the indication of where I take it from and why originally it wasn't jargon. It is, of course, the Lucretian word having to do with the movement of the atoms, which allows for some limited but real degree of freedom in this world. As the atoms fall down through space, according to Epicurus and his disciple Lucretius, they always swerve, and in that swerve is the possibility of some freedom for the human will, some freedom for what we now call the creative imagination. Following, he had read Epicurus in translation, he had read Lucretius in translation, he was very attached to a rather remarkable feminist novel of the day, which I admire very much, I'm surprised no one has revived Francis or Fanny Wright's fine book called A Few Days in Athens, which is a historical novel about the life of Epicurus, and we will bring it in directly in the first six sections again. He's talking about Adams very deliberately. He is saying, I am not like Whitman, even though I come out of the mode of self-reliance, I am not like Whitman, an idealist. I found myself indeed upon experience or materialism, and that does make the difference between us, and I don't think at least the lack of self-esteem, because he knew the experience very well, and alludes to it perhaps a little ironically a few times in the course of Song of Myself. But the third line, therefore, is meant to have a precise indication of his saying, I mean, this is the equivalent, if you are writing in 1855, of saying, I am a materialist in the European tradition. I am not an idealist, and therefore I mean to be an American materialist and not like my master Whitman, an American idealist. And I think that it's... Uh, but heaven, what did I say? Uh, I'm sorry, I meant Emerson. I meant Emerson. But then he does something which has social reference, and one ought to look at that immediately. If you, and this is going to come up in the second of these crisis sections, um, it is of some importance to know about Whitman that he was raised right out here on Long Island and then lived uh, in Brooklyn in his young manhood and then moved back to um, the family <coughs> homestay in the strange years that he underwent before his sudden emergence out of nowhere, really, as a poet in the 1855 Leaves of Grass from a Hicksite Quaker family. It seems strange to think of the heresy within the Quakers, since they are nothing but heresy. But Elias Hicks was an itinerant Quaker revivalist, a sort of evangelical Quaker, odd as that sounds, in the 1840s and early 1850s, the 1830s, 40s, and early 1850s. Whitman was raised a Hicksite Quaker, and though he did not remain a Christian in any overt way whatsoever, there are very strong formative elements that come out of the Quaker tradition in him, and we will see some of them in just a moment. Uh, there is, however, a defiance of the Quaker background and also of the whole ethos of America in his time. To loaf for you and for me is not a shocking term. It has no stigma. If your friend calls you on a particular day and she or he says, what are you doing today? And you say, oh, I'm loafing. It's taken as a rather sympathetic term. It means one is resting and cultivating and so on. But oddly enough, we owe that usage to Whitman. It is a term of the highest social stigma in his day. To be a loafer is something worse than it would now be to call somebody a bum. Indeed, it is to be a social unfortunate in every way. And he's therefore using the word for its deliberate shock value. And that's why he repeats it. And you need to recover something of that ambiance of the term. I loaf. He means to hit the reader with it and invite my soul. And by soul, he means something quite definite. He means soul in the Emersonian sense, but with a deep departure from it, which we'll see in a little while. In any case, I, who celebrate myself, also loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass, and that clearly will have something to do with his title, that leaf-like spear of grass will form the title. The origin of it, as I recently uncovered, and I always suspected it was there, though it goes back to certain biblical and classical tropes, and we will talk about that perhaps more next time than today, because it has a strong influence on um, Stevens. He had been to a lecture on the poet, not the lecture you've read on the poet, but a less effective one, also called The Poet, in a lecture series called The Times, given in New York, and he regularly went to Emerson's lectures. Uh, when they reached 
New York, and in them, fighting the <coughs> biblical trope, Emerson says at one point laconically, we say all flesh is grass, and then goes on to observe that as readers of the book of nature, we are indeed turning the leaves of our flesh. Already the characteristic trope of the title is presented to Whitman, and he quite clearly picks it up from that source, though again with a considerable difference, because he is deeply worried from the start about how much he owes to Emerson. And then I want to jump ahead, having looked that closely at the opening, to go into the whole question of what is involved with these different uh, psychic eventualities. Look at page 66. He has talked about already the movement on his part whether speaking as a comprehensive eye, or whether speaking as the eye taking the role of Walt Whitman, one of the roughs in American, and clearly the eye is closer to that than it is to the other two psychic instances, as it were. But the real me, or me myself, the troublesome element in the poem and throughout Whitman's poetry, if you know the poem, which I'm not asking you to read for next time, beautiful parallel poem of the Siege of Pieces, written in the winter of 1859-60, to 60, now in the section of Leaves of Grass Coat, along with myself. Uh, one is the very famous Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking, the other is an even more effective poem, a companion piece, as I end with the ocean of life. In that poem, if you know the poem, you will recall that the real me, or me myself, identified by the same terminology, comes to Whitman and mocks him as a kind of demon, a dusky brother on the speech, mocking his pretensions, mocking his achievement, pointing to the sands below, pointing to the book which would appear to be the 1856 or second edition of Leaves of Grass that the grief stricken Whitman had taken to the beach with him. But when this figure, whether you judge it to be a male or a female aspect of the self first appears, there is no mockery in it. And what can one say about that depiction? It is a passage which is very dear to me, but passage surely remarkable in itself. He it says, what passes, what comes and goes, are not the, the innermost self. The innermost self, the what I am, and I think the echoing of the I am, whether out of Coleridge or the Bible, or both together, or from the use of it, particularly in um, at the end of Emerson's essay experience, where we didn't look at the instance of it, but it is remarkable, is deliberate here. Apart from the pulling and hauling, now that means not only competition, the sort of meaning it still has as a phrase for us now in our contemporary America, pulling and hauling, but it had an erotic meaning, very definitely. What we would now call foreplay or sexual byplay in the popular slang of the 1850s is pulling and hauling. Apart from the pulling and hauling stands what I am, presumably most truly am, therefore the me myself, or as he was now elsewhere, the real me, stands, and what can you say about this stance? the standing of this figure in relation whether to erotic pulling and hauling or just competition, just busyness on anyone's part, stands bemused, happy, complacent, compassionating, not detached, not cut off, full of fellow feeling, <coughs> idle, unitary, integral, very much at one with herself or himself, looks down, doesn't matter what direction, as it were, is erect, and then very charming, or bends an arm on an impalpable certain rest. Sometimes you can see young boys or young girls doing that, you know, where I would fall over on my face or my back, because that certain rest is really quite impalpable, sort of gymnosophistic trick. And then most charming, looking with side-curved head, curious what will come next, and then summing up the stance both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it. What's the charm or attraction of that stance? Whether you take it as being sexual or quasi-sexual, or whether you simply take it as a human charm. Clearly the passage is charming and is meant to be charming. What is charming about it? When you run into that in a person, whether a boy or a girl, it's hard to think of this as involving an older person. When you run into that as a person, what would the appeal of that be as a representation? or as a mode of representation. Yeah, rustic and naive, certainly. Would you say naive? Yeah. No, certainly not. No, that's fine. I mean, there, there is a mode of sophistication there. But you're implying something else, so go on with that. It's knowing, and yet it isn't a bad knowingness. 
certainly isn't a sophistication in any bad sense. What is the meaning of that very American line, both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it, presumably the game? Very famous line. Yeah. There's a sense of playfulness and self-humor. There's a kind of self-irony Okay, and understanding that after all it is only a game, and yet since there is only that game, there is no other life, not wishing to be wholly out of it, and yet by seeing that it's a game, being in a sense out of it, watching it, being observant, wondering at it, wondering at it. Okay, y'all, there's a suggestion of holding oneself in abeyance, wondering means marveling also, it could be an irony there, but it is a friendly irony. The charm is looking with side curved head. If somebody is talking to you, it sort of looks at you with side curved head, curious what will come next. Like to say, what are you going to do next? What are you going to say next? The side curved head would seem to suggest what? But if you confronted it in a person directly, it is as though, very gently, and only slightly mockingly, the person is saying what to you. Well, I will examine you from a different perspective, because somehow if I look at you straight, it isn't going to come out quite right. It looks down, is erect, or bends an arm on an impalpable certain rest, stands, amused, complacent, compassionating, idle, unitary, whatever that is, it is not Walt Whitman, one of the roughs, an American. To me, I repeat, it does seem more, let me say, because Freud has somewhat jarred the word feminine for us, let me say gently more female, than male, it does raise the whole very difficult question of Whitman's sexual identity, but that I think we can clear up very quickly in terms of what we actually know about Whitman's life, and far more important in terms of what Whitman's poetry overwhelmingly demonstrates. Uh, Whitman is not at all a homosexual poet. There is no evidence that there was any actual homosexual experience in his life. There certainly is plenty of evidence from both the poetry and the life that if he hadn't been so preternaturally shy and indeed so deliberately cut off and to some extent solipsizing a narcissist, that his real sexual desires were indeed homoerotic and never heterosexual. But what the poetry goes to some considerable lengths, whether you read it literally or as trope, and there's a real problem in that as we will see in the first crisis section of the poem, And for some reason, I suppose it is because, whether in the age of Freud or in earlier ages, there is still an enormous stigma and taboo attached to the whole question of self-gratification or masturbation, Um, onanism, to use the biblical term for it, in a sense. Uh, Critics have refused to see it clearly. I cannot see how they can avoid it, just as you and I will not be able to avoid it in a moment. But it is deliberate, it is, I think, whether tropological or literal, it is presented by Whitman. This too one can put off for a while. Enough to notice at this point that so far there is some kind of a gap between the figure speaking the poem, who seeks to celebrate himself, and another aspect of the self which stands apart. The fifth section, quite directly, gives us a real difficulty which I have never seen dealt with, because Whitman just is not read closely enough. I believe in you, my soul. So when Whitman is saying I, the reference on the whole is to be myself, not the real me or me myself, but Walt Whitman, one of the roughs, an American. When he says you, by and large, he (coughs) is being addressed throughout this poem, that instance or agency called the soul, which is, however, not only not the real me or me myself, but can't get along with the real me or me, myself. This is the hardest and most original notion in Whitman, and you will not find it in any of the commentaries on Whitman. And yet, look at those two lines. I believe in you, my soul. The other I am, which goes right back to apart from the pulling and hauling, stands what I am. Now, there is an other I am. The real me or me, myself, must not abase itself to you, my soul, and you, my soul, must not be abased to the other, which is the other I am, or the real me, or me myself. The poem will show you instance after instance, as Whitman's poetry in general will show you instance after instance of what we might call 
commerce, frequently conveyed, movement back and forth, frequently conveyed by sexual imagery, imagery in fact of masturbation, between the two aspects of what Whitman is willing to call myself, the outer self and the inner non-persona, the real me or me myself, it will show you, beginning with the curious, apparently elaborate embrace, but if you look at it closely, it is indeed what I once joked at and called gymnosophistry. It cannot be worked out in human terms. The passage we're about to go on to, I mind how once we lay such transparent summer morning. But the basic point is this. There are relations between Walt Whitman, one of the roughs, an American, the outward persona, song of myself, song of Walt Whitman, one of the roughs, an American, and my soul. There are relations, though they are more complex, between, and they will end very badly indeed, and as I ebb with the ocean of life, and then they will undergo a last strange transformation in when lilacs last in the dooryard bloom. There are relations between the outward persona and the real me or me myself. There can be no relations, evidently, except master-slave relations, mutual abasement or domineering between the real me or me myself and this figure called the soul. Now that is very difficult, and I have not seen anyone try to meet this difficulty, but I would like to see us meet this difficulty. If we cannot do it yet today, since we need more information, then I hope we will do it right at the beginning next time. But notice those lines, because I think they are in some ways the most important and most difficult lines in this poem. I believe in you, my soul. And they are lines impossible, for instance, to make out in terms of our map of the mind, which is essentially Freud's. I believe in you, my soul. The other I am must not abase itself to you, and you must not be abased to the other. And you have that passage having to do with the first embrace, which evidently precedes the kind of annunciation which leads to the breakthrough, which is the writing of this poem in its original form in 1855. But let me give a very quick bit of biographical information, which even the latest biographers of Whitman, like Justin Kaplan, for some reason want to slide over, and I don't think they should. Uh, Whitman came from a very difficult family indeed. And there's reason to believe, on the basis of his own account of it, and the basis of journal material from his surviving siblings, that Whitman, as one of the younger children in this rather tormented group, protected himself from the others a kind of semi-autistic stance, not quite autistic in the technical or psychotic sense, but a borderline condition of autistic behavior when he was a young child, both as he represents himself and as the others describe him. He held himself apart through a kind of voicelessness and through a lack of affect when he was very young, and he had every reason to, because it was quite a household. Walter Whitman uh, Sr. was a master carpenter and, as I say, a violent Hicksite Quaker, but most of the time he was violently drunk and very brutal, and when he wasn't beating up poor Mrs. Whitman, he would be doing little things like lying drunk on a roof somewhere which was half completed and then crashing through and being out of it for six months while various broken bones mended. Not a good father, obviously, to have her out the house. Mama Whitman seems to have retreated into sullenness and something very near a borderline condition uh, herself, um, you can see that something is very wrong by what happened to the others. One of Whitman's sisters, though biographers do not like to talk about this, died um, as a poor in a forty house. Um, another uh, was afflicted by a venereal infection all of her life. Uh, at least one brother um, seems to have gone mad from syphilis or a syphilitic uh, inheritance. All the others ended very badly in one way or another. It was quite a brood and quite a household. And there was, I think, a deep kind of genius at work in Whitman from the start, protecting him by the kind of semi-autistic quality. I think that has to do, in the end, with the real sexual <coughs> orientation, which pragmatically, I repeat, was autoerotic, even though in his year means um, homoerotic. Well, this too can wait for a moment. But one goes back to this for this reason. Once you have had that curious embrace, that gymnosophistical encounter, only quasi-sexual, between my soul <laughs> and Walt Whitman, one of the roughs in American, you get the first of the passages of a kind of religious celebration in the pump. 
the mode is most certainly the mode of Hicksite Quakerism, or indeed of any Quakerism. Anyone in this room who has ever attended a Quaker meeting, whether as a participant or as a spectator, I have frequently gone, of course, not as a participant, but as a spectator, um, old-line Quaker groups, particularly young ones, still follow this procedure. There is no set course for the worship. As the spirit moves an individual personage there, he or she stands up and testifies. And they tend to follow a certain declarative mode in testimony, which, while not as sublime as the Woodmanian mode of testimony, and not as quite biblical as the Whitmanian mode of testimony, is rather close to this, at least in ethos and spirit. Swiftly arose and spread around me the peace and knowledge that pass all the argument of the earth. And then you get a series of statements of what it is that Whitman knows. And I will ask the question, what is most remarkable about this passage, particularly as it proceeds? And I know that the hand of God is the promise of my own. And I know that the Spirit of God is the brother of my own. Now, that is actually more Emersonian in its theology, in its implicit or emergent theology, than it is Quaker or Hicksite Quaker. But what follows is not only Hicksite Quaker, but then is Whitmanian in a profound degree, and is very strange. There is still, after all, some aspect of the conventional mode of Quaker confession, the done with amazing power, when he writes in that all the men ever born are also my brothers and the women my sisters and lovers. But what follows is striking, and that a Kelson of the creation is love. Now, Kelson is an old New England word meaning what? If you read the glossary, as you should. If you don't know a word, you should, of course, look it up. Kelson is what? Keel son, meaning what? What is the Kelson of a ship? You say the whaling boats that were sent out from Nantucket in the old days. It's a word that occurs frequently in Melville. In order to keep the keel from being broken up in rough weather, what do you do? Well, I was, I was going to say it's primarily the backbone from which the, the, the essence of the ship is stuck with the strength. Yeah, but it's not the backbone. It's not structural. It's added on, which is the point, um, which is the point of uh, Whitman's trope. Um, it's quite strikingly not part of the structure. It's not wood, a Kelson. Um, since you're going to take that boat out in very rough seas indeed, and you don't wish it broken up by storm, what you do is you add a metal plate to reinforce the keel, and that will keep the keel from splitting. If you say then that a Kelson of the creation is love, then you're saying that love is not implicit in the creation. It is not a fundamental constituent. It is not, therefore, like Freud's eros, the gathering as compared to Thanatos as a dispersing element. It is not like the Platonic eros. It is not necessarily part of the structure of creation, but that if you don't have it, the creation itself will break up. Now, that is a peculiar notion and it's something to think about when one tries to define what the Whitmanian Eros is. What follows is even more striking. And limitless are leaves stiff or drooping in the fields. Now certainly there is phallic or sexual imagery there, as there always is with leaves and flowers and especially weeds in Whitman. But more importantly, there is a reference to the title, and there is also the deepest external identification, an identification or introjection, to use the Freudian terminology of defense is, after all, Whitman's most characteristic trope. Not projection, which is to spit out, did I say Whitman then? I meant to say Whitman. Um, I'm getting so tired these days that sometimes I use one name when I mean to use another. We are speaking of Whitman and Whitman alone at this point. And limitless are leaves stiff or drooping in the fields. Now, clearly there is identification, introjection, a swallowing up rather than a spitting out. And then it becomes more striking. And brown ants in the little wells beneath them, and then carrying originality to a hair-raising kind of a point, almost a lunatic sort of dimension, and mossy scabs of the worm fence, heap stones, elder, mullein, and poke wheat. How do you read that line? One of the strikingly original lines in the language. 
its basic feature, tropologically, or you might say psychically speaking, is introjection or identification. It is very persuasive, particularly in its context. To identify yourself, and we all of us have that kind of mood, I suppose, at our most generously introjective, but to carry it to the point of the very mossy scabs in a fence nearly eaten away by worms, heap stones, and then loose weeds of apparently the most useless kind, elder, moulin, and poke weed, almost the deepest element in identification on Whitman's part, and it carries you back and is meant to carry you back to the paddle leaves of grass. Because ultimately what he means by leaves of grass is not um, the sort of grass that grows on your lawn or the grass that grows in a meadow. What he thinks of as leaves of grass are either when you're down by the shore, as in as I ebbed, the sea gluten, that growth, the stuff that you find where the water meets the land down at your feet, the chaff, the... What does he call it at one point? When he says sea drift, and means that for the whole title of the poem, that would do it, sea drift. The foliage down there at the water's end is what he deeply identifies with, or just elder moulin and coqueweed. Funny weed-like growths that are good for nothing, but even the popular term, as he is grinningly relying on, of coqueweed suggests the... American term of poking, which back in 1855, as in Southwest America today, most certainly does have the male sexual impulse at work in it in a playful kind of a way. But what is that as a trope of identification? How, how is one to record it, or how does one talk about it? Notice that it ensues upon a unitary moment, recording evidently the occasion for celebration in this poem. The poem opens, I celebrate myself. And what I assume, you shall soon. The you means the reader, but it also means you, my soul. And there's a deep implication, I think, throughout the poem, and this is difficult, but I think finally rewarding, and this also I have not seen noted or written about, <coughs> that Whitman's best path to you as his reader is to assume that you too in your relation to otherness, are in relation to your own soul. Not in relation. That is to say, your relation to the two aspects of yourself has very little to do with your relationship with other selves. But your relationship to your own soul has a lot to do with your relationship to other selves. That, too, I think, is deliberately non- or anti-Emersonian. You recall the definition in nature, where my soul is one entity, and the not me comprises my body, other selves, external nature, and all of anteriority, all of the past. Whitman is obviously trying for a much more radical and comprehensive mode of identification, for which, as he will rapidly demonstrate, since nothing is indeed got for nothing, you pay, and he pays, a very high price. But I still don't want to leave this passage until we consider what is he doing when he deliberately takes you down so apparently far in the scale of being and identifies himself most fully with those weeds, whether here with land weeds or in the sea drift pieces with the sea gluten, with the sea lettuce at his feet. Well, there's, when you're down at that level, there's this intense sense of particularity. Everything is so small. That sense of, I mean, and also the sense of the cataloging, and that they're just one thing after another, and the scatteredness, but at the same time you're united with it all, this particular focus on that particular, which is, to me, is really striking. This sense of unity with this particular, with these particular things. Okay, okay, and certainly in that search for the minuteness, but also something else, surely, if you can identify yourself, and if you can therefore extend love, the love that you have for yourself, to 
just that particular limit of nature, then you've done something to the whole scale of being, and you've done something to the whole mode of evaluation. Turn the page, and I think you see what he is doing, and what becomes section six. Very extraordinary passage, and certainly the most beautifully written so far in the poem, and I'd like us to look at it in length, and then pass on to a crisis section in the middle. It is certainly that moment in the poem where he is most directly trying to define what he is doing in his title. A child said, what is the grass? It's an awfully queer question. Fetching it to me with full hands. How could I answer the child, I do not know what it is any more than he? He is quoting almost verbatim from A Few Days in Athens by Mrs. Francis or Fanny Wright, where Epicurus questioned by a disciple as to the whatness of anything, including vegetation, replies, and this is pure Epicureanism, the what is unknowable. You can answer a question about the how, and you can answer questions about who, which are questions about identity, but you cannot answer a metaphysical question in this materialistic doctrine. The what is unknowable. Therefore, I cannot answer the child. I do not know what it is any more than he. But this does not prevent me from choking it, from turning it and you get an elaborate and extraordinarily beautiful and playful series of tropes, which as they proceed become quite hair-raising also. And indeed become, they almost define, I think, the American style in poetry. They become indeed more and more American. Now look at the first of them, and it's a throwaway. It's very charming. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition out of hopeful green stuff woven. A very charming line, playing, of course, upon the word disposition, but doing it, of course, in terms of European tradition, in which green is traditionally a color of hope, as blue is a color for imagination or for a certain mode of innocence being Mary's color. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition out of hopeful green stuff woven. That is to say, I am, as my master Emerson said, like all of American literature, in the optative mood. I am hopeful. <laughs> It's a strange joke on Emerson's part, but it is literalized by Whitman. Then he goes on to a really striking passage, very striking too, because you will find in the letters of the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins to Robert Bridges, just this passage quoted. He refused to read Whitman because he said, well, Whitman is a real scoundrel, isn't he? But you can hear underneath that, since Hopkins was and had gone into the Jesuit order, as we now know, in order to fight his own homosexuality, a realization, since it was homosexual circles, John Addington Simons and others who had taken up Whitman very early on in England, a fear that the explicit homoeroticism of some of these passages is just too much a violation of decorum. But one sees why Hopkins admired these lines. And, of course, they refer to now an archaic and delightful social custom lost the last forever. Or I guess it is the handkerchief of the Lord, a scented gift and remembrancer designedly dropped, bearing the owner's name some way in the corners that we may see and remark and say, whose, a few of you are closer to my generation and will have no trouble with the passage. If one teaches it to young men and young women, they don't know what one is talking about. Well, they don't. Not if they come from the Northeast, especially. Young ladies in the Northeast do not drop scented handkerchiefs so that you will pick it up and return it to them at a dance or at some other occasion. But that, of course, is the reference. It is the most traditional American, and before that, English mode of flirtation. Yes, but you drop the handkerchief. Yes, it does survive. It does survive in that form, my dear. But you and I, alas, I more than you, of course, are dated. Or I guess it is, but notice by attaching it to God, I guess it is the handkerchief of the Lord, a scented gift and remembrance of And this is the grass. This is God flirting with us, bearing the owner's name some way in the corners. If only we could figure out the way, if only somehow get to the corners of the grass, we would read the true name of the Lord that we may see and remark and say, whose? Which is to ask a question not polite and yet not skeptical. And then a very beautiful speculation, or I guess the grass is itself a child, the produced babe of the vegetation. And that has a purpose, as we see a few tropes further on. Then you get the democratic trope, as you would expect, but very much in an Egyptian term. Uh, the whole issue of the hieroglyphics was first raised in America after Champion's decipherment or discovery by Emerson, but Whitman was fascinated from it almost from the start, fascinated by it. And I think one can surmise why, in terms of the crisis passage we're going to go on to, 
In one of the Egyptian creation myths, absolutely grotesque to our ears, because we can understand other modes of creation myth, whether Greek or Hebraic or even Norse, but we can't know what to do with this myth. One of the particular gods creates the universe not in a solitary priestly code kind of a splendor, like the first chapter of Genesis, but by simply masturbating the whole universe and all of us into existence. That obviously had a deep fascination for Whitman, and we will see why we get an overt reference to it, but also the whole notion of the hieroglyphics as being a way older than the Hebraic or the Christian way of coming to terms with ultimate truths fascinated him but for him, what matters also is the uniform element, and it means sprouting alike in broad zones and narrow zones, growing among black folks as among white, in the remarkable list, Tanuk Takaho Congressman Cuff, in which you go from Canadian to Indian to congressman to a kind of street ruffian. I give them the same, I receive them the same, and then breathtakingly cutting right across a trope that you could swear he must have stolen from Homer. You would think it must be there in the Iliad, but it isn't. It is the greatest instance of a Homeric trope in the language, and yet it is original. And now it seems to me the beautiful, uncut year of graves, the sweep of that line, and the extraordinary apparent referentiality of it is not less than Homeric, and then the hair-raising passage. You know, occasionally, teaching abroad, one looks for certain passages, and in poetry one tends to look in Whitman and in Stevens, in, I, I speak of myself now when I say one, uh, maybe I took that up as a bad habit from Stevens, and that we'll talk about next week, his characteristic evasiveness, his beautiful evasiveness, which centers on the so-called impersonal version of a third person. Uh, he will not say I, and he does not like to say he, in speaking about even himself, so he says one and it is an evasion or a self-deception as well, an elusive deception of us. Well, one points to a book like Huckleberry Finn or to the prose style of Hemingway, which emerges from it, but which also has an origin here. There's a funny American way of writing, of which this is one of the great instances. And I pose it to you as a question. I mean, like, like the opening of the second section of When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed, this seems to me very profoundly American, very hemingway -esque very Stevensian, very Mark Twainian, <coughs> overwhelmingly Whitmanian. This grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers. Now, it's a shocking line because long before the surrealist, <coughs> it transcends surrealism. It is irrealistic in the highest degree. If you work out the trope even very quickly, you get the shocking image of a whole series of mamas who are buried in the ground, and their heads are sort of coming up <laughs> through the grass, and he is playing on the fact that green, when it is very green, and he knew a lot about color matters, gives the appearance of being black. And he says, this very green grass, this grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers, darker than the colorless beards of old men, and then varying the trope even more shockingly, dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths, in which you go from the rather grim image of those somehow, if you literalize it, and I don't think one should over-literalize it, having the heads there in the ground, now you actually have the level of the roof of the mouth up to the roof of the earth, as it were. But he follows that out. He doesn't let, this time he holds on to the literalism of it. Oh, I perceive after all so many uttering tongues. When I look at the grass, when I look at these weeds, these spears of grass, what I perceive, after all, are so many uttering tongues. And he means a difference between perceive and see. When you perceive, there is cognition in it also. And I perceive they do not come from the roofs of mouths for nothing. And he goes on to speculate about the whole question of life and death. And we can set that aside until we look at that towards the close of the poem, where he does something really rather remarkable with it. What about the series of tropes for the grass? That they are original goes beyond gainsaying. They are very hard to <coughs> absorb, that peculiar element of facticity. But go back to my question, which is, I think, a useful question, because it's more than stylistic. It opens up the question of the curious Americanness of Whitman. What is American about that passage? Why does one go abroad? 
and say to an Israeli seminar or a British seminar or a French seminar or a Japanese seminar, if you want an instance of what sounds American, what about this? This brass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers. What does Hemingway ask about that passage? Or Stephen? What makes it American? So that one doesn't think of that as a British passage at all. A British poet earlier or later would have written in that mode. Why, why does one say that? But a monosyllabic poem. Monosyllabic has something to do with it, and I think Stevens learned a great deal about monosyllabic usages from uh, Whitman. Whitman seems to have understood from the start two things about the use of monosyllables. One, that if you really want to wait a line and slow the reader down, proceed by monosyllables. Two, that if you have only one word in a line which is not monosyllabic, the reader will have to pay special attention to it. It will have a shock value. And here, of course, the word is mothers, which adds or lends something to the irreality, the beyond surrealism of the passage. So the monosyllabic element in it, there's something else too. That the passage is so almost dead level, literal as it is, not just monosyllabic or almost monosyllabic, but so curiously literal, so flat out, Okay, okay. A kind of flat out mode of statement, more than a little laconic, apparently somewhat without affect, but shockingly so, when it's talking in terms of an image as violently unreal or irreal or surreal as this is, the declarative mode, the sort of I am now making a literal remark, which isn't a literal remark at all, but which is peculiar and shocking. This grass is very dark. I mean, you're saying it in a perfectly matter-of-fact way. This grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers. Which, you know, one is taken aback. One says, what? <laughs> Why the white heads of old mothers? And then he doesn't let you get away from it. Darker than the colorless beards of old men. The colorless beards of old men. But that means a white which has gotten so white as to become a colorless or color dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths, that means a green which is so green that it's black, a red so red that it becomes dark or black. Also, a funny overtone of mortality in both statements. So a flat-out mode of writing which proceeds by indirection, which is surreal, which tends to favor the monosyllable, as though you are simply telling things the way you think they come. But why this context? And why in terms of this trope of grass? So I come to the title, and we will come back to the title, and I don't want to stay with this more than a moment at the moment, but I always find it odd. I've ventured on this several times myself in print, but I can't ever quite solve it. It's a very strange title, Leaves of Grass. It certainly does go back to the two major tropes, one most certainly classical, though partly biblical, the other overwhelmingly classical. The trope of the leaves is, or the fiction of the leaves, as Stevens will come to call it, which I've written so many elaborate commentaries on. You will find one in a chapter, if you're interested, called Milton and his precursor to the book called The Map of Misreading. You'll find another in the section called Transumption, which is the third and last chapter of a recent little book called uh, The Breaking of the Vessels. Um, I, I just throw that out very quickly. Um, the trope of the leaves we know. It goes back to Homer in the Iliad, proceeds through Virgil, and Dante goes on through Spencer and Milton, where they compared, of course, to the fallen angels and leaves falling in Lollabrosa. becomes most famous in English by the poem which culminates this tradition and deliberately changes it, where they become words, the poet's <coughs> own words, Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. Then have a long history in 19th and 20th century poetry culminating in Stevens. Following that, it always has to do with the fall of the leaves, the annual fall of the leaves, as indicating the brevity of human life because the initial trope is Homer's when he says, why ask one, one hero says to another as they meet in battle and the other not wishing because it's a great disgrace to fight someone lower in social rank and less heroic than yourself. One of them asks the other, 
you know, what is your ancestry? And the other says, do not speak to me, do not ask, O noble fellow, of the generations of men. The generations of men are like the leaves from the trees falling and so on. And meant to deprecate human life, it is a trope of human mortality from the start. But it is not as shocking as the great Hebraic trope from Isaiah through the general epistle of James and the epistle of Peter in the New Testament, always playing itself out again and again based on the actual cruelty of the way grass grows in the Judean hills. Anyone who, like myself, has gone through many springs in Jerusalem knows why the prophets and those who came after them said so bitterly and cruelly, all flesh is as the grass. Because you do not have a long and beautiful expanse of lawn you know, even at Dagon's resident, which they struggle daily to water that grass, it isn't going to do any good. It's always burned out. The cruelty of the Jerusalem spring is you look out one particular day, and suddenly those eternally brown hills are a bright green. With, it's come up overnight, and there are scarlet poppies, and the school children, much more intrepid than I am, being tough little mamzerum, are running out, I say running out, to pick those poppies. They're bloody fools, because there are stones and rocks all over the place, and under every rock or stone there is a scorpion. But never mind, they are dashing out, being tough youngsters, and they are picking these things, and they know why they're doing it. Because in a bad Jerusalem spring, it gets so hot so quickly that the sun has burned that away. I can remember one year, in three or four days it was gone. And when you therefore say all flesh is as grass, you're using a very cool trope in a Hebraic context or in the New Testament context, since that too, after all, is centered on Jerusalem. To say all flesh is as grass is not even to suggest that one lasts as long as the annual cycle. It is burned up, as it were, in human terms, in just a few days. So you're putting together two tropes of mortality in that title, Leaves of Grass, one essentially classical, the other essentially Hebraic and Christian, one of them much darker than the other, but you're, notice what you're doing. The book is not called, and I know this sounds grotesque, Grasses of Leaves. It's called Leaves of Grass, and that's not just because he is very attached to the image of a weed as a kind of essential trope of self-identification, but something else also. Leaves in a trope which goes back to the sibyl and the burning of the leaves in Virgil, and picked up again and again after that. Leaves are also the leaves of a book. And therefore, leaves of grass are pages made out of grass. And there's a suggestion following Shelley, a poet whom Whitman knew and appreciated, and some of his poems like To a Skylark in the Ode to the West Wind, he'd actually cut out the North American Review and paste it up in his early notebook, which reminds me of something that I meant to say before, but I left out. Um, they are words, but they are dead words but they can quicken a new birth. So that seems to be part of the complex of the title also. Yeah, what has he done with them here? And at this point, I will bring in the thing I left out before. And I left it out, I guess, for some of the same reasons of repression that the biographers, including Justin Kaplan, leave it up. Whitman had written a lot of poems. They were rhyming poems. They are very bad poems in his earlier years. Um, when he was the editor of the Brooklyn Ego and a successful young journalist and a young man about Broadway and so on and so forth. He got very tired of that. He went home. He dropped his glittering career. He went home and he loafed, getting drunk with his brothers and his father, rejoining a family he had rejected when he was very young, obviously returning to his ground, going back to origins, going home again. He did that in the early 1850s when he was already going into his middle thirties. He doesn't begin, however, to write, and I can even pin down, I think, in the notebook what the origin of it is. It's a passage right there, which he writes in the notebook maybe as early as 1854. I myself went first to the headland, and clearly referring to what, let us call it for the moment, the autoerotic trope, but we're going to get onto that in context in a moment. That's the first thing he ever wrote, which becomes part of his mature poetry. It may even have been prosed at that point. It's very hard to know from his place in the notebook. What we do know, beyond a doubt, is that Walter Whitman Sr. started to die in the early spring of 1855. And at just about the time that he found out that his father had no hope to live, Whitman suddenly burst forth 
into the few excited mumps of composition of what was to become the 1855 Leaves of Grass, including the initial version, A Song of Myself. And it's also not an accident that the day that the poem was offered for sale, which is just about the 4th of July, 1855, Walter Whitman Sr. died, and at that point, Whitman emerges into full voice. That haunted him, and that has something to do with the crisis that he has in 1859-60, and the crisis that is repeated in 1865 in the Lilacs elegy, ostensibly for Lincoln, but not for Lincoln at all. Really an elegy for the poetic self, because after those 10 years, 1855 to 1865, which I like the 10 great years, 1797 to 1807 of Wordsworth, Whitman, as the American Wordsworth, is the same shocking phenomenon as Wordsworth himself. Wordsworth goes on writing poetry for more than 40 years, 43 years in his case, and it is all garbage. Whitman goes on writing poetry for nearly 40 years, and it is almost all of it a last garbage, except for a few fragments. Something kills the poethood in both these major 19th century poets. I think it had something to do with the genesis of the poetry in them. But I want to trace the first crisis now. So turn to page 86 of this volume, or to a particular moment in section 84, if you have uh, a different kind of an edition. Look at the opening of section 24, as he finally calls it, because remember, he adds the section divisions only in the later versions of the poem. So he presents himself as the myself of the title, Walt Whitman, a cosmos of Manhattan, the sun, this external persona or self, absolutely false, of course, turbulent, fleshy, sensual, eating, drinking, and breathing, never bred, but he managed to make up many stories about that, many love affairs in New Orleans. When the widow of Alexander Gilchrist, the ferocious Mrs. Gilchrist, a member of the Rossetti circle, Gilchrist having been Blake's biographer, took too strong an interest in Whitman, started to write him really rather ferocious love letters, and finally announced that she was crossing the ocean and she might embrace him directly. He had previously been saying his letters to her as a kind of cover, that he'd been a very sinful fellow in his youth and had many illegitimate children strewed about the New Orleans area. But directly he heard that she was coming to see him and to throw herself upon him. He wrote her letters in great alarm and letters to everybody else in England saying that at pain of death she was to be restrained and he and this lady were never to be allowed to meet. The idea of a you know, consubstantial human female intending to actually embrace him was more than the poor fellow could stand. But I think it went further than that. I think as I read it, and I think there's plenty of both internal and external evidence for this, the whole of his homoerotic life consisted of one brief encounter in the tragic winter of 1859-60, out of which the Sea Drift poems come, when indeed he discovered, as this poem puts it, to touch my body to someone else's is about as much as I can stand or bear. Interesting switch on my part. Bear is the operative word indeed. In any case, here he portrays himself, he portrays himself in terms of identification. And that's the crucial thing, because this is going to begin an enormous movement in the poem of a most amazing sort, in which he's able to venture forth from these multiple selves or aspects or agencies or instances of the self to embrace not less than everything, and to embrace it in the sense of interjecting it or identifying not so much himself with it as it with himself just as in an early passage in the poem when he says he is luxuriated by the atmosphere, he does not say so much that I am mad to be in contact with it. He says I am mad for it to be in contact with me. And the very term contact he had learned from Emerson. Emerson, writing about the classical writers, writing even about Plato, in the essay on Plato and Representative Men, which we know Whitman had read, Emerson said, unfortunately, these Greek writers compared to almost, and of course, this is a trope on Emerson's part, he must have known really how sophisticated the biblical writers were, but he said, compared to these almost illiterate sheep herders are wanting because they lack contact. And of course, Whitman keeps crying out that Emersonian term contact, which even in Emerson is a trope for something else. It is not meant as being directly sexual, Whitman makes it directly sexual, and yet falls away from it. And notice how this passage goes, because after you get 
certainly one of the most powerful passages in him as the afflatus or the inspiration, line 506 or so, last line on page 86, flows through him, he proclaims counterparts and says he will not accept anything in a kind of universal synecdoche unless it is available to everybody else, at least in counterpart forms, on the same terms. And then you get an astonishing passage, which again exemplifies this kind of Quaker testimonial celebratory force, only now almost inconceivable force. The rhetoric of it is overwhelming and terribly moving. The pathos is too much for me. I won't even read it out loud. First of all, by the way, you should read Whitman out loud. He is a throwback. He remarked in one passage in Emerson, I think it's either in the essay Spiritual Laws or the essay on the Older Soul. Uh, I don't blame myself for not remembering because, as I say, except for the essay experience, all of Emerson's essays are really interchangeable. Something could just as well be in one essay as in another, and this is not necessarily a fault. But Emerson taught Whitman what I think we should remember also. You know, the Yahwist did not write for you to read it silently. No writer did. No classical or Hebraic or Christian writer or ancient writer of any kind wrote like that. It is St. Ambrose who first remarks how amazing it was to him mm -hmm. to watch his own teacher reading to himself without even moving his lips. That is to say, the whole mode down to the late medieval period in which people read was even if they were by themselves, they read aloud, whether to themselves or another. And that this was so habitual that when you read by yourself, you were always moving your lips, as though you were saying it in some hushed kind of a way. Whitman was very struck by that and marked the passage. And clearly, more than any poet since, he means you, and try it, you know, when you're alone, or try it with somebody else. Read him aloud, because something quite astonishing really does happen. But I won't read this aloud, because it moves me too much. It's this great passage beginning with, through me, many long, dumb voices. It is enough to provoke you to tears because it is truthful. One really does have a sense that the pathos of this is accurate, that something previously unvoiced, incredibly enough, in thousands of years of recorded Western literature is coming out here. Because who else does speak for the prisoners and slaves, the diseased, the despairing, the thieves, the dwarves, the threads, the wounds, the father stuff, that is to say, the seamen, and of the rights of them, the others are down the far, the heartbreaking very American mid-19th century expression. But then again, that utterly, I, I can only say here raising, even thinking of this trope of the ear coming out of the earth as the grass, because it is so shocking and astonishing to raise your level of identification to the scads in the mossy worm fence, to the pokeweed, but also fog in the air, beetles rolling balls of Done. There is something preternatural about that, and yet perfectly convincing, somehow only in this poet. And then, something that sounds as though it is going to herald a sexual revolution, but it turns out not to. Instead, you get an astonishing passage, which itself still shows you that only Whitman, because we are going to go on to passages now, which I guarantee are going to embarrass some of you. I always find, particularly when I teach an undergraduate class at Yale, which is not many than anybody can bear, because we still have two very large taboos in the West, which Freud certainly did nothing to take away from us. One is autoeroticism or masturbation. The other is a kind of primal narcissism of worshipping your own body. And that is certainly what is happening here. Uh, it is not quite as deliciously funny as when elsewhere in the same poem, Whitman cries out with marvelous homeliness. He says, there is also much of me and also delicious. But this is quite wonderful, too. Divine am I inside and out, and I make holy whatever I touch or am touched from. And then he starts smelling the aroma, you see, of his own armpits. And he starts praising his own body, a kind of deep narcissistic attachment. And that becomes stronger and stronger. And then a passage which always does remind me of a very significant difference, let us say, of Whitman from Freud. Freud thought that particular passage in the mad Dr. Schreiber's book, which absolutely established Dr. Schreiber as being perfectly paranoid indeed, is a very great passage where Schreiber says that when the son, S-U-N, which is after all his own father, rises up against him and would try to kill him, he, Schreiber, 
strikes back by becoming a son in his own right and sends forth a kind of a power. Look at what Whitman can do with this. He goes from self-celebration to a realization that something in him is offending nature. And he does it quite specifically in terms of not only phallic, but onanistic imagery. Uh, so at the bottom of page 88, or at about, this is still towards the end of section 24, that must be about line 557, something I cannot see puts upward libidinous prongs. Now, it's obviously himself, and a libidinous prong is just what these days they rather certainly call the signifier. Sees a bright juice suffuse heaven, and there's no doubt as to what that bright juice is. But what follows is remarkable. In the most heartbreaking moment in his poetry, the moment of self-condemnation and as I with the ocean of life, Whitman makes it even more explicit. He says, nature, and I'm quoting verbatim, nature here in sight of the sea, taking advantage of me to dart upon me and sting me because I have dared to open my mouth to sing at all. Amazing lines. Nature here in sight of the sea, taking advantage of me to dart upon me and sting me because I have dared to open my mouth to sing at all. The notion is that a poetic initiative of any kind far from being, in the words, worthy in symbiosis with nature, is indeed, and this is quite Emersonian, and quite American, antithetical. Where is that? Yes. That's at the opening of the site with the ocean of life. Um, nature here inside of the sea. But here's another version of it. The earth, though it's milder, the earth by the sky stayed with, the daily close of their junction, the heave challenge from the east, which is the sun blasting at him, that moment over my head, the mocking taunt, See then whether you shall be master, or whether or not the sun, as the central element in nature, shall be the master. And then this astonishing passage, in which the astonishment is the ease of it. I know of no other poet in the history of poetry who would make such a declaration, and who would also add the extraordinary and always, saying, look, this is not an epiphany. I can do it at any time. The sun rises against me, dazzling and tremendous how quick but he's playing on quick, as he always does. It means quickly, but it also means quickening, alive rather than dead. Dazzling and tremendous how quick the sunrise would kill me, if it wants to kill me, if I could not now, and think of the self-confidence of this line, the admirable, relaxed, persuasive self-confidence of this line, if I could not now, and always, and always is the shocking self-confidence, send sunrise out of me, and then a marvelous identification of himself with Yahweh, surely. We also ascend dazzling and tremendous as the sun. We found our own, for myself of my poem, Walt Whitman, and my soul, O oh my soul, and the calm and cool of the daybreak, even as Yahweh walks in the garden in the coolness, for so that is evening rather than daybreak. And then goes on, with an astonishing line, a line that if you're interested in him further, I try to trace the development of this, you'll find this if you're interested in a book called Agon in a chapter on Whitman's image of voice in particular relation to the Lilacs elegy. He has a very special meaning for this trope of tally. T-A-L-L-Y is a very strange word, isn't it? It goes back to the Latin, Latin talea, T-A-L, actually Greek, originally, T-A-L-E-A, -E meaning a twig, or a branch or a cutting that you use to put notches upon in order to keep score. But it requires even in classical days that other meaning of keeping score, the talea or twig or branch, as far back as Alexandrian poetry, as far back as Bayan and Moschus, picks up that other notion of tallying, of keeping a kind of sexual score. Now that becomes first British 17th century slang and then American slang right down to this day. If you look at any good dictionary of American slang like Wentworth's, you will find that curious word tally. You'll find it in the form of tally man, tally woman, tally whack or whacking, or tally wag or wags. Always words referring to the male genitalia, always words referring to a somewhat improper sexuality. In Whitman, it has a very definite meaning until it becomes to the tally of my soul. And he uses it here already in that later meeting that is meaning that it's going to have in um, the Lilacs Elegy, the Elegy for Lincoln, 
He says of himself, this is about line 574, I guess, I underlying causes, to balance them at last, my knowledge, my life parts, and there's no question what he means by life parts. He's playing on the biblical meaning of knowledge. My life parts means my life parts, my genitalia, it, my genitalia, keeping tally with the meaning of all things, notching, keeping score of the meaning of all things, and then continues to talk about himself as a heightened kind of sensitivity, and I want to jump ahead to save time and reach the way in which the crisis builds up. The first, I think, of the most amazing passages, not only in Whitman, but perhaps in any modern poetry whatsoever, in any language I'm able to read. Absolutely peculiar passage. First you get an extraordinary passage, the one about line 604 on page 91. This is towards the end of section 26, about the trained soprano. I don't want to comment on it here. I've written various readings of it in print. But then he talks about himself in praise towards the middle and close of what becomes section 27. And look what he writes. He says, mine is no callous shell. I have instant conductors all over me, whether I pass or stop. Now, obviously, that has to be the case if you have the potential to identify yourself synecdocally with every object outside the self, object meaning person, or down to a pokeweed, or a beetle rolling a ball of dung. They seize every object and leave it harmlessly through me. It does not damage me. I merely stir, press, feel with my fingers, and am happy. And then an amazing line, a line which retains its equivocal force until this day. Because in American English, it still has this curious force. And notice, by the way, that except the relatively unimportant else's or about, the monosyllabic element is chiefly violated by person. So that person takes on the same force here as mothers did in the earlier passage. To touch my person, it was stand, but not there. To touch my person to someone else's is about as much as I can stand. If you or I, or if you can imagine someone saying that to somebody else in ordinary speech, it can mean to this day in American English two absolutely different things. It's like an antithetical primal sentence, just as Freud talks about antithetical primal words. Not, by the way, in British English, but in American English, because it admits of two meanings. The first and the likelier one, which I'm pretty sure is what Whitman intends, is to touch my person to someone else's is about as much as I can stand, meaning I just can't stand. But the other meaning, which is surely related to it, and which lies well within the genius of the languages we use, it means just the opposite, doesn't it? It means it's such an ecstasy for me that it seems to take me beyond my limits or my capacity. Now, the implicit interpretation comes in the what becomes the 28th section, which is a very weird and extraordinary section, and I'd better read parts of it aloud, because otherwise it is very hard to believe, plus especially hard to believe, is to juxtapose this with any commentator whatsoever, and I mean any commentator whatsoever, because I repeat, you may literalize this as much as you wish, or you may look at it as metaphor as much as you wish, but you'd better see what it is that you are dealing with. No one is present except Whitman himself. I run into a lot of resistance with that when I say that to audiences, including seminar groups. But there's no question about that. What is happening in the passage is that two voices are heard, but they are both Whitmans. That is to say, the external Walt Whitman, one of the roughs and American, is making an approach to the real me or me myself, not by a gymnosophistical embrace, from Osama you reach out to both the beard and the toes at once, stretching yourself beyond human limit, but by masturbation. And there's no question about it. And I repeat, I leave to you the question of how much this is or is not literal. But then, is this then a touch? Is what then a touch? Quivering me to a new identity. Flames and ether making a rush for my veins, and then the unmistakable line 621. Treacherous tip of me, reaching and crowding to help them, which is clear enough. My flesh and blood playing out lightning to strike what is hardly different from myself, again clear enough. And all sides prurient provokers, they are a fancifulness coming from the superheated moment, stiffening my limbs, and the stiffening my limbs is clear enough, and then a shocking image, an image which violates decorum. But one sees why it is here, because of the pastoral image of the herd. 
and of the one singled out by the herd and pushed to the headland and worried. What, by the way, is a headland? It could be a 19th century word for a word that we still use in certain places in New England. What is a headland? The more usual word, the dictionary word, is what? Well, a promontory. A headland is some tongue of land, as it were, which is surrounded on three sides by water, usually, you know, longish and narrow, with only a short strip joining it to the main body of the land. This is sort of peninsula-like. It is promontory-like. There is the suggestion, usually, that it is a high place, so that if you are worried from it, you are not at sea level, but you are thrown headlong into the sea. And that figures very strongly in this passage. And the utter of my heart, which at first seems like a terrible violation of diction and decorum, is accounted for by the imagery of the herd which follows. It's a prolepsis, as one says in rhetoric, of what is to come. Behaving licentious toward me, taking no denial, depriving me of my best as for a purpose. Now, best simply means my best garb, unbuttoning my clothes. He is doing this to himself, of course, holding me by the bare waist. And then the pastoral imagery begins, deluding my confusion. And look at that funny play, deluding and confusion with the calm of the sunlight and pasture fields. Then a remarkable line, extraordinarily inventive line as trope. In modestly sliding the fellow senses away, leaving only the sense of touch, meaning that one goes into a vertigo or phantasmagoria in which one can't really see, and one can't really hear, and one can't really smell, and one can't really taste. Everything else is in suspension. One is overwhelmingly a quivering touch. And then, speaking indeed of a kind of sexual game, still popular in America in those days, they bribed to swap off with touch and go, a kind of version of post office and graze at the edges of me. You see the pastoral image there, graze at the edges of me, because the treacherous tip of me is indeed the edge or the headland of me. No consideration, no regard for my draining strength or my anger. Anger presumably because the me, myself, or real me has been surprised and is in some sense being interfered with, is being sexually molested, though only by, evidently, the outward self. And then fetching the rest of the herd, and that can only be, I think, a question of the other senses, or the other aspects in the broad sense of self, and then that astonishing line, then all uniting to stand on a headland and worry me. Now notice the triple repetition of the headland, and of course worry has what meaning? In terms of the pastoral image, to worry here does not just mean to cause anxiety, it means what? Yeah, yeah. The way, you know, if a beast nuzzles you, it is worrying you. We still use that. You know, if a dog can't quite decide whether or not it's going to bite you, but it's sort of poking against you, we say it's worrying me. It's a particular kind of animal movement. So here also. But then that triple repetition of headline, as though it is crucial, including that phrase which comes straight from the notebook and is, so far as I can tell, the seed, the start of all of, not just the first edition of Leaves of Brass, and therefore of Song of Myself, but all of Whitman's characteristic poetry, all the poetry that he was willing to publish from 1855 on. I went myself first to the headland. My own hands carried me there, just in verse, went and myself. It is a prose sentence in the 1854 notebook. I myself went first to the headland. My own hands carried me there. It isn't in juxtaposition to anything in the notebook very hard to know what he means by it, but he evidently, a year later, seizes upon it, and my guess is, since we know from the state of the notebooks that he didn't write this poem consecutively, or any of his poems consecutively, he probably wrote this crisis passage, which would make sense in terms of my knowledge, my life parts, it keeping tally with the meaning of all things, and then with the image of the wounded hermit thrush, the wounded throat, and the image of castration. Here, Coffin that slowly passes that bit of my sprig of lilac, so well fits the context of the tally and the surrender of the tally, the surrender of the gift of voice after a heroic decade in the lilacs elegy. So, following the headland and the jar here, then all uniting to stand on a headland and worry me, the centuries desert every other part of me, that is to say, what we would now call the defenses. 
They have left me helpless to a red marauder, and I suspect that the red marauder is simply myself, but perceived as red because almost through bloodshot eyes, since the other senses are fading out and touch is dominating. They all come to the headland to witness and assist against me. Why the image of a headland, which I haven't asked you before? I am given up by traitors. I talk wildly. I have lost my wits. I and nobody else, because you suddenly recognize what you are doing, am the greatest traitor. I went myself first to the headland. My own hands carried me there. And then to instantly get rid of the notion that he, whether in or out of the poem, feels any of the stigma or shame that our society then or now puts upon masturbation as a supposedly secret act, an act that Mr. Norman Mailer once injudiciously disapproving of it called bombing oneself, which is the most horrible phrase imaginable. Bombing, my dear. B O M D I N G. But Norman Mailer is not always, shall we say, <laughs> happy in his tropology. Uh, never mind, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. I'm sort of angry at his publishers because. They somehow managed to get out of a review which strove not to give them a phrase they could quote <laughs> in an advertisement. Mr. Roger Donald is so shrewd in that way that he managed to do it. Never mind. Why, why a headline? And look, a, a bit more, the more important point, notice that there is no statement here. Whether by the man writing the poem or the figure within the poem, why does one say that? The villainous nature of the touch is not the nature of the operation. It is the notion of it coming from outside, and notice something. You villain touch, what are you doing? My breath is tight in its throat, and then you give up. Unclench your floodgates, you are too much for me. To make it perfectly clear, one comma. But then suddenly, no sooner has one comma, then suddenly the villain touch is no longer a villain. It is <coughs> blind, loving, wrestling touch. Sheep-footed, sharp tooth touch. Did it make you ache so, leaving me? In which the touch is now identified with the sexual release. Yes, sir. Well, a homosexual encounter in which no one is present <coughs> except the self? But star everything about the passage, my dear, makes clear that he is alone and that he is touching himself. Look, let, let, let me follow this through. the difference between uh, I myself, of course, goes to him and then that great wrestling touch that comes from without. Well, the touch is felt as coming from without, but right through it there are more than enough verbal clues to indicate that no one is present, I mean, this does have to do with what he's prepared you for, with three psychic agencies or instances. Look, let me go through this again, because this is of the highest importance, and I believe I can refute you, and that you will accept being refuted. He says, mine is no callous shell. Let me resume. I have instant conductors all over me. Whether I pass or stop, they seize every object and leave it harmlessly through me. I merely stir, press, feel with my fingers. There is the image of stirring and pressing. To touch my person to someone else is about as much as I can stand. Is this then a touch? Quivering me to a new identity. Flames and ether making a rush from my veins. Now the only issue is who is touching whom? I say Wolf is touching Wolf. And I would take it even further. I would say that myself, the song of myself, is touching the real me. Or me, myself. There is initially confusion and resistance. And then there is abdication and a giving up to it. Treacherous tip of me reaching and crowding to help them. Now notice the them, not to help him, my dear, but them, plural, because the antecedent is my veins, my own veins, quite clearly. My flesh and blood playing out lightning to strike what is hardly different from myself, because indeed it is not different from myself, trying to help them in the plural, not him. Had he in the slightest, after all, he writes plenty of homoerotic passages, the whole Holomus section in Leaves of Grass is nothing but homoerotic encounters, which I firmly believe had never taken place. In this passage, one has a solipsistic, autoerotic, and narcissistic being 
experiencing an extraordinary intensity. And look at what the image of the headland is, by the way, because let me switch to the other side of this. Let me switch to the other side of this. Why the image of a headland, of a promontory, and of being worried on a headland? Yeah, but, but think of it now. If you say, I mi went myself first to the headland, my own hands carried me there, you do not mean that you have reached out your hands and you are embracing the genitals of another male. No. You mean that my own hands... Yeah, but the you villain touch is, of course, his own touch, which then becomes blind, loving, wrestling touch. All through the passage, the touch is spoken of as something, because what is speaking is the real me or me myself, which now feels only confusion in the face of the villain touch, which has taken the place of what you can call the executive factor in the agency of the self. Walt Whitman, one of the rocks, and American who is inaugurating this, but stick to the image of the headland, because, you know, I, I will tell an instructive <coughs> tale. I gave the original form of that essay on um, the Battalion of My Soul, that reading of Lilacs, um, in to an audience of Whitman scholars, and had the joy of being hissed, because the Lilacs elegy opens with <coughs> a rather extraordinary moment. In fact, read it with me now, because we, we may as well have this, you know, right out on the table, as it were. Uh, the Lilacs poem is where? Memories of President Lincoln, page 351, uh, in this edition, or wherever you are in your edition. You have the initial section of the poem giving you the major tropes of the poem. The triple trope of Lilac, the great star of Venus, early drooping in the star, and the thought of him I love, Lincoln, or the other, or the dead father, and ultimately, I think, the poetic self, the elegy for one's own poetic self. But then you have, and this is wholly characteristic both of human life and of a certain tradition of erotic elegy, it goes right back to Bayan and Moschus and to the origins of the Western pastoral elegy, but it also goes to what we know about ourselves. In moments of acute object loss, be they of the melancholiac kind, because there's been a loss of the erotic object, or the loss of a beloved to death, or in moments of tremendous reversal or anxiety of the self, or a real danger to the self, we know that most perfectly normal human beings have a very strong urge to masturbate. That sexual excitement is involved and that there is a need frequently for an immediate auto-erotic gratification or relief. I think that Whitman actually is audacious enough in the second section of Lilac's Last in the Dooryard Bloom to speak of an impotence, a failed masturbation on his part. Because that is the overwhelming point. They are not somebody else's hands. They are just as much his own hands here as they are in the earlier passage. You know, that Miss Black and I are now disputing. A powerful western fallen star, or shades of night, or moody tearful night, or great star disappeared, or the black murk that hides the star, or cruel hands that hold me powerless. My own hands, which are cruel, they hold me powerless because I cannot get a rise out of myself. I am so struck. You may hiss, you may make a face, you may say, I am making a lovely poem grotesque. I think one is merely confronting the truth that Whitman wants one to confront. And if you wish to refute my reading, you must find a better reading in terms of the actual words of the text. Or cruel hands that hold me powerless. It is highly characteristic of Whitman that he has the audacity to speak about a failed masturbation. And, you know, do not underrate, and I don't say this in any severe way, your own sense of a violation of taboo, your own feeling that somehow masturbation is not a proper subject for poetry, or that there is a stigma attached to it or whatever. Whitman evidently did not feel that, and frankly, I do not see why one should feel that. But that is another story also, and I am hardly sitting here as an advocate for masturbation. We are dealing with a text by Whitman, because why the image of the headline? If you write, as he wrote in the notebook, I myself went first to the headland, my own hands carried me there, there is certainly a notion of venturing yourself into danger. 
there certainly is a notion, and he clearly does associate the writing of poetry with auto-erotic gratification. My knowledge, my life, heart, it keeping tally with the measure of all things. But look how the rest of this passage goes. There is no other present. Star, is there? There is only oneself. I mean, he would be most extraordinarily oblivious of the presence of a lover, would he not, to write in this way? Unclench your floodgates, you are too much for me. Blind, loving, wrestling touch, sheep, put it sharp to touch, did it make you ache so, leaving me? Where the confusion, of course, did it make you ache so, leaving me? It's absolutely clinching. My dear, look, he's speaking to his own touch. And now he takes it in. He says, I no longer cut myself off from you. Did it make you ache so, leaving me? What could the leaving be? Except what then follows. Parting is picked up from leaving. Tracked by arriving. Perpetual payment, perpetual loan. Not made but by another. But by the body to the body. Or the body to the self. Rich showering rain. And recompense richer afterwards. And then an audacity, which is Egyptian, and which he does take from the old text, the text of masturbating a world into being. Otherwise, this has no meaning, my dear. Sprouts take and accumulate. Stand by the curb. It's absolutely audacious. Stand by the curb, prolific and vital. Landscapes projected masculine, full-sized and golden. He's saying that this apprehension of the landscape actually comes from his having created a world in this kind of a mode, and notice that he's still pursuing this in the 30th section as he moves towards what he regards, and I don't pun on this, as the rhetorical climax of his poem. That extraordinary opening out of what becomes the 31st section, I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars. And then takes you into the minutiae again. But look at the 30th section. You are talking about a birth, and it is an onanistic kind of a birth. With all truths wait in all things. They neither hasten their own delivery nor resist it. They do not need the obstetric forceps of the surgeon, because we are speaking of a different mode of birth. The insignificant is as big to me as any. What is less or more than a touch? Since after all, what is less or more than a touch? Which is performed by the self upon the self, and then surely to settle, my dear. Go past four more lines. A minute and a drop of me settle my friend. It's overwhelming. I, and then utterly charming on his part. Again, utterly audacious. I believe the soggy clots shall become lovers and blacks. And a compend of compends is the meat, which is the old 19th century term for it in America, of a man or a woman. And then goes on to expand into the possibility momentarily of a heterosexual. I mean, there's no question that his deepest personal yearnings were homoerotic. There's also no question that the love that he actually celebrates in Song of Myself is autoerotic. But I, I don't want to catch ourselves too long on this issue because I want to press on to something else. Here you have an apparent crisis which is resolved on simply realizing that the touch is after all one's own, which is why I fight you so hard on this. And by doing that, it's all right. It's not a crisis at all. But that isn't the major crisis of the poem. And let, let me take a little extra time today. We, we have a little more time anyway. I want us to turn to page 107 and to sections 37 to 38, where something really astonishing happens. Um, and it's a shame to have to do it like this, um, because what you have towards the end of section 37 relies for its impact upon a tremendous series of sections, almost 20 in number, in which the progressive identification of the self with all possible others has reached overwhelming complexity and vitality, and has now also passed into its negative face. After crying out, agonies are only one of my changes of garments, which is one of the greatest single lines in Whitman, he moves to an even greater one after a depiction of a massacre, and also of a terrible sea wreck and a sea fight. I am the man. I suffered. I was there, overwhelmingly persuasive in its context. But then a moment which, whether he knew it or not, 
shows the limitation of the self. And I want us to talk about this and have some discussion of this in the time today, because this is very deliberate on his part, even if he did not understand the origins of this. There is one thing right down to this day, but very strong in the entire history of Quakerism. It is no accident, my dears, that so many successful bankers and business people have come out of the Quakers. The one thing, the one New Testament virtue that they do not emphasize is the holiness of alms giving and alms receiving. A beggar, or as it was called in the 19th century, an asker, is the one absolute disgrace that the Quaker, Hicksite, or Orthodox is not supposed to convey. And here is Whitman, whether he knows or not he knows it comes from his heritage, and he is so deeply sophisticated that I suspect he does. Look what he does to himself. He takes you through identification after identification, which is more and more persuasive, more and more uncanny, and more and more frightening because of its negativity. That's top of page 107. Now the mutineer walks handcuffed to jail, but I am handcuffed to him and walk by his side. And then an amazing parenthetical bit. I am less the jolly one there, and more the silent one with sweat in my twitching lips, which is horribly convincing, of course, as a detail. Now, the youngster is taken for larceny, but I go up too and am tried and sentenced. Not a cholera patient lies at the last gasp, but I also lie at the last gasp. And then it's rather awful. My face is ash colored, my sinews gnarl. Away from me, people retreat. You know, I really so over identify that I become an object of aversion to all others. And then the supreme becoming an object of aversion. Askers, beggars, embody themselves in me and I am embodied in them. Now notice that is total mutual introjection. I project my hat. I hold it out, sit shamefaced, being after all a man of Quaker heritage, and beg. Suddenly it is too much even for Whitman. He starts screaming. He has over-identified. The whole synecdochal element in his poem literally blows up in his face, and surely quite deliberately. And you get this astonishing crisis. Enough. 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 Now, it is the self speaking to the self, but he's also saying, look, readers, for once, don't come closer. Get away from me. Somehow I have been stunned. Stand back. And he pushes the reader away from him. He says, give me a little time beyond my cuffed head, slumbers, dreams, gaping. And then the most bitter line he ever wrote, a line that haunts me, a line that should haunt all of us when we are trapped in repetition compulsion. I discover myself on the verge of a usual mistake, where the word usual is very grand. But I could forget the mockers and insults. Suddenly he has become Jesus Christ. An amazing identification. That I could forget the mockers and insults. That I could forget the trickling tears and the blows of the bludgeons and hammers. That I could look, and here's the real shock, with a separate look on my own crucifixion and bloody crowning. And suddenly the crisis is passed. One of those amazing transitions in Whitman. I remember now, but he's playing, as he always plays on language, I remember now. I put my limbs or members, like Osiris or like Christ, together again. I resume, very ironically in the language now, the overstayed fraction, where fraction plays both on break and on the part as compared to the integer. The grave of rock, and yet this must be the story again of Christ, multiplies what has been confided to it or to any graves. Corpses rise, gashes heal, fastenings roll from me. Those would be the grave clothes, presumably. I troop forth, replenish with supreme power, one of, and then he gives you the uniform or universal again, the democratic, an average, unending procession. Now, the passage is quite amazing. Let us talk about it for a bit. Because to get into this passage is to see something in Whitman far more startling than that passage that I've insisted upon reading as a kind of auto-erotic <coughs> declaration of a creative error. Is he saying here that when he makes his Christ identification, which is the pinnacle, that this is terrible and that's the enough enough, or oh, not? Oh, no. No, he's saying just the opposite. No, no, no. He, he's going beyond Emerson. Emerson had said <coughs> another passage that he had outlined, a very scandalous passage, in which he calls upon Americans to be greater than Jesus Christ. Emerson once wrote, Speaking of the crucifixion, he says, this was a great defeat, but we, meaning Americans, we demand victory, a victory to the senses as well as to the soul. Now, it's a very great and scandalous passage, and it is Emerson explaining why he is no longer a Christian. Whitman is no Christian either. 
But look what he is doing here. In fact, he's rather like Lawrence in The Man Who Died, and he deeply influenced the Lawrence of The Man Who Died and Lawrence elsewhere, just as almost all of Lawrence's mature poetry is quarried out of Song of Myself and a few other poems by Whitman. If you want to test it out, look at the extraordinary little chapter on Whitman in the mad book by Lawrence called Studies in Classic American Literature. Now, something else is happening in this passage. And the Christ is almost irrelevant. He just wants an audacious instance of a final self-identification. He has over-identified. It's too much. He is reminded that even he has a particular genesis or a particular origin as a Quaker that he doesn't really have, that nobody can have, these totally universal sympathies. But we all know this mode of over-identification. I remember my students in 1968 to 1970. I say this because many of you are too young to remember that time. They had all over-identified, generously over-identified. I'm not being ironic, much as I opposed them at the time, because I did feel they were doing themselves harm, were the victims of every kind of oppression. They couldn't do their work as students. They all became lemmings rushing down to the sea. We had a very famous mass hysteria. No matter that it did partly protest the Vietnam War, like all great awakenings or mass religious revivals, it was a larger phenomenon than that. But I have followed the careers of many of these young men and young women who walked out on classes at the time. And the recoil from over-identification, most of them wound up as much less generous human beings than they'd originally been. Human beings much less on the left, much less involved in social protest. They over bourgeois in recompense. That is to say, they had over-identified, their selves were put in danger, and there was a deep recoil from it. Well, they are Whitman's children in that regard, but with this difference, Whitman sees it as happening, understands that he has violated the particular question of personal origin by the over-identification with a beggar, which as Quaker he cannot bear. It is the ultimate violation of taboo. It is the taboo he cannot violate with impunity. He is therefore forced to a sense of limits, He's forced to a sense of saying, if I am all men, then I am also Christ, Jesus, then also I have suffered the crucifixion. But the shock is that I could look with a separate look, if that is the price of over-identification. And then, like that son, he can always send forth out of himself, so the sense of he can rise from the dead, as it were, in this astonishingly strong passage. But, well, let us begin with this passage next time. I shouldn't keep either you or myself later than this today. Thank you. We must argue this point another time. Embarrassing as it is for all concerned. But you're nice and stubborn. I like that. Resistance to authority is a very good thing, even if, alas, I am the authority.